Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from today. I hope you're keeping well and safe. Um, my name is Sundar Jadeja, Technical Manager at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, the CDSB. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the first of our two sessions on accounting for climate, where we'll be looking at what the accounting standard setters and investors expect from companies when it comes to climate and financial reporting. I I'm really delighted to introduce three real heavyweights um, who will be joining us today. Nick Anderson, member of the International Accounting Standards Board, the IASB, David Pitt Watson, executive fellow at Cambridge Business School, and a former co-chair of the United Nations Environment Programmes Finance Initiative, and Natasha Landau Mills, head of stewardship and partner at Saracen and Partners. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, we've set aside plenty of time for questions at the end. So whether you're joining us on this webinar platform or if you're streaming in from LinkedIn, YouTube, and I've just learned Facebook as well, please do drop your questions into the Q&A box or comments um, wherever you're joining us from and, and these will be shared with me. I'd like to begin by briefly introducing the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, CDSB, for those who aren't familiar with us. We were set up in 2007 at the World Economic Forum to advance integration of climate related information into the annual report, the mainstream report, for the benefit of investors to aid in their capital allocation decisions, ultimately to support in the transition to a low carbon future. And we've since expanded to also cover the reporting of environment and natural capital matters as well. So the bedrock of the CDSB's work is the CDSB framework for reporting environmental and climate change information in the annual report, which consists of seven guiding principles, which are aligned with the IFR standards, basically the how to report, and 12 reporting requirements, what to report. The CDSB framework was one of the starting points when it came to development of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD's recommendations which were published in 2017. The TCF recommendations have been a significant driver in the, in the, in the uh, movement towards better narrative reporting of climate related information by companies in recent years. And as a kind of a very early caveat, there's still a long way to go in this space as we've seen by the recent TCF status report, which was published last week, but there's clear progress being made. Now, one particular area where a lot of thought and work is still required is reporting of potential and actual financial impacts of climate related matters on businesses covering both climate risks and opportunities. And this often leads to a question as to whether the climate related matters that are reported in the front half of the annual report, the management reporting, the narrative reporting, the annual reporting um, is actually being reflected in the financial numbers and the accompanying notes in the back half, or you know, what I refer to as financial reporting and financial statements. And this has led to concerns as to whether there may be a disconnect between what's being reported in the NAV report in the front half and what's been found in the financial reporting by companies. And so whether investors, users of reporting are actually obtaining the complete information they need when it comes to decision making. Now, part of the challenge here is that the financial statements are very much the domain, the remit of the accounting standard setters. So to begin, it makes sense to ask Nick Anderson, member of the International Accounting Standards Board, who's been doing some thinking on how climate related matters and related risks might be considered in an IFRS standards kind of IFRS accounting standards kind of perspective. Um, so Nick, to start us off, can you uh, can you explain and uh, you know, sorry, to start us off, um, can and should climate related matters be considered when preparing the financial statements? And if so, how does it fit with the standards as they are currently written today? Thank you, Sandip, and many thanks to CDSB for inviting me to participate in today's webinar. Um, I'm going to spend most of the next 10 minutes talking about an article uh, that we published last year that it directly addressed is the issues that you raise. How do the current requirements in IFRS address climate related risk? But before I do that, I want to say a little bit, bit about the reach of IFRS and, and actually how investors uh, think about these issues. So just on um, uh, our second slide talks about where IFRS today is used. So today, 144 jurisdictions 
uh, require the use of IFRS standards for publicly accountable uh, companies. I think we have a map here it is. And IFRS is also uh, permitted in a further 12 countries, including Japan and Switzerland. And beyond this, both China and India are on a path to convergence to full IFRS. So a wide scope, a wide reach. Before I joined uh, the International Accounting Standards Board, I spent over three decades working in global uh, equity markets, either managing portfolios or research teams. And um, I always think of investment research, as we see on, on, on the next picture, as being a bit like detective work. It's about gathering information from multiple sources, verifying, triangulating. Uh, it's forming judgments based on that evidence and then using your own experience to reach a view. So for most fundamental investors, audited financial statements remain the pivotal of that work. It's a foundation for building the investment case. But also, and critically, investors seek to ensure that the story portrayed by those financial numbers is consistent with the narrative presented by management in other forums. And that could be in management commentary, press releases, analyst presentations, roadshows. It's, it's seen that there is a coherent and consistent message that helps the investor build trust in management and confidence in their own investment case. So until recently, there'd been a perception, certainly amongst investors, that climate related matters were largely limited to management commentary uh, and that the financial statements had very little to say about this. And a logical place for an investor to start to understand how requirements might relate to climate change would be to look at the index, as we see here. We have altogether 38 pages of index at the back of our book of requirements, but you won't find the words climate change in the index nor will you find them in the standards themselves. And the reason for this is that our standards are principle based. So equally, although the words cannot be found in the requirements, IFRS standards do address climate related risk. So we sought to bridge this, this communication gap. This was the genesis of the article that we published uh, last year, highlighting how our standards could be applicable to climate related risk. Uh, this was work inspired by uh, the Australian Accounting Standards Board and their Audit and Assurance Standards Board. And the article sets out two ways in which IFRS standards can contribute to the reporting of climate risk. Firstly, through the requirements of specific standards, and secondly, through reflecting the overriding requirements of IS1 regarding the disclosure of material information. Now, I'm sure many of you will have seen that the trustees of the IFRS Foundation have launched a recent consultation about sustainability reporting and indeed the possibility of establishing a sustainability standards board. I'd encourage everyone to engage with the trustees in this consultation, but I want to also make it clear that this has no bearing on our conversation today and how climate risk is reflected under our current standards, under our current requirements. So. The first mechanism which we show on the next picture is, is how IFRS can contribute through the specific requirements of accounting standards. So for instance, under the standard uh, for property, plant and equipment, companies are required to estimate how long an asset will be useful, which in turn determines the depreciation rate. Climate risk might shorten an asset's useful life and could force a company to accelerate the depreciation of that asset. Climate change might lead an exploration company to the conclusion that it might not be able to recover some of the cost of its assets. The carrying value of these assets might need to be reduced under the, our standard for impairment. And then under IS 37, for instance, a utility might be forced by climate change to adjust its estimates of future decommissioning liabilities and increase its level of provisionings. Now, as I say, there are no new requirements or guidance included in the article. This is very straightforward, simply applying the current standards to climate related risks. But beyond this, there's a second way in which IFRS can contribute, and that takes us beyond the requirements of individual standards to the overriding requirements of IS1. And so if we move on to the next slide, you appreciate that under, IS, under IFRS, a company must disclose uh, information, uh, must, must consider whether to provide information not required by specific standards 
if that information is necessary for the primary users of financial statements to understand the impact of transactions, other events, and conditions on those financial statements. So this is about ensuring users receive material information, the material that really matters to them to understand the financial statements. We're very clear about what we mean uh, in terms of materiality. And this is, this is defined through the eyes of the investor, it's through the investor prism. And it's, it's information that could be reasonably expect to influence decisions that investors make on the basis of those financial statements. Importantly, it's not just about size. It's also about the amount. Uh, it's also about the nature of an item or even a combination of both. And furthermore, um, and going back to, to, to reporting and management commentary, um, it's, it's worth emphasizing that these are IFRS disclosure requirements. And so reporting this information in outside of the financial statements, whether it be in management commentary or perhaps a sustainability report, is not a substitute for including the requirements within the financial statements themselves. In, in 2017, uh, the board published some practical examples around uh, best practice for the application of materiality. And on this page, I include some ex extracts from two of the examples. Um, I mean, obviously, it's important I'd emphasize to read these examples in full. Um, example C, the first example we have on this slide is very germane as it relates to an entity that owns a coal fire power station in a country that is part of an international agreement is committed to reducing uh, or introducing regulations to reduce the use of carbon based energy. And so if you follow the particular scenario that's portrayed in this example, we reach a conclusion that whilst our standard uh, on impairment IS 36 does not require an entity to disclose those assumptions to determine the recoverable amount of a tangible asset. In this example, the entity concludes that the assumptions about the likelihood of the national enactment of those regulations to reduce carbon-based energy, as well as uh, the impact that uh, plan may have, those disclosures are important and they should be included in the financial statement. They are material. The second example emphasizes that our definition uh, about what is material is not solely about the size of, 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 a, of, a, of a matter. It's also about the nature of that matter. The nature of the matter may make it material irrespective of its size. So for instance, even if an entity concludes that climate risk will not impact the amounts recognized or disclosed in its financial statements, it could still be appropriate to disclose the assumptions that were used in reaching that conclusion if they were uh, perceived to have an impact on decisions taken by investors. And I think that's absolutely critical. So just to sum up from my perspective, um, IFRS standards do address climate related risk and they do that through the requirements of both specific standards, but also the overriding requirements in IS1 relating to the disclosure of material information. Many of these requirements, clearly we, we've talked about st standards that are described as IASs rather than IFRSs. So many of these requirements have been, place in, have been in place for years and just to reiterate, the article does not set out new requirements or any new guidance. But what has changed in my mind, and I'm sure David and Natasha will highlight this in a moment, is that I think it's very difficult, if not indisputable, uh, that climate change is now a material issue for investors. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so, to, so from my perspective, the message is clear. Whilst climate may not be explicitly referenced in the IFR standards, like any other risk, um, they should be considered by companies when it comes to preparing financial statements and where material should be reflected appropriately in the numbers or the accompanying notes. So David, one of the key points that, that Nick um, brought across was in addition to size, um, materiality Consider assessments also require consideration of nature, qualitative considerations. Um, so in relation to the latter, 
you know, investor views should be considered when it comes to determining whether and how climate related matters are reflected in financial reporting. So you've been engaging a lot with investors in this space recently, um, and it'd be really helpful to understand what investors are, are thinking about, what they're expecting when it comes yeah, to that's, accounting that, that, climate. That, 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 that's great. Thanks, Sunday. I, and I myself am, uh, by background, a an investor, and I, I know that uh, the investment community within the investment community and between the investment community and the issuers there has for a long time been a degree of confusion about uh, whether or not climate needs to be included in the back end of the uh, in the back end of the accounts um, many investors actually the pioneer with this was, was Saracen who we'll hear from Natasha uh, uh, later said look the principles of accounting surely mean that um, given that we've got tens of trillions of dollars signed up to Climate Action 100 Plus and a, the IIGCC and series and all this th sort of stuff, this has to be material and it has to be material because we will at some stage deal with the climate crisis. But nevertheless, that was not typically what you would find when you looked at the accounts of a company. I mean, in fact, I, I can't think of any company historically that's been doing this correctly. And therefore, that was one of the reasons that investor groups approached the IESB and Nick and his colleagues and said, look, there, there's confusion on this because we'd interpret the principles this way and uh, a, a, that's not what it is that was happening. So investors hugely welcome uh, the clarification that the IESB has given. And <clears throat> if I was to sum it up, I mean, this actually is a quote from, from Sue Lloyd, one of uh, Nick's a, a, a colleagues who's the technical head at the ISB, she said this, if climate is material, you have to take it into account if you are complying with IFRS. So 140 countries, IFRS is mandated, if you are complying with the mandated accounting standards and climate is material, you need to take it into account. That I think is a very big step. But there's another couple of big steps that we should talk about here. Here's the second one. We also uh, approached the International Audit and Assurance Standards Board. And they have written a complementary paper to the IASB paper. It concludes, if climate change impacts the entity, the auditor needs to consider whether the financial statements appropriately reflect this. So it's not just the issuer here, it's also the auditor that now needs to take this into account. And just to be clear, it says climate must be considered if you are using the mandated audit standards, IFRS, otherwise you're in breach. And climate must be considered if you are using the mandated audit standards. Otherwise, you're in breach. And that's, I think, a, a, a quite a big a, a change. And um, as Nick has said, though, it's not a new standard. It's the interpretation of the existing standards. And why has the interpretation one that needed clarification? Well, because over the years, climate has become a much, much more acute issue. But also because, as Nick says, this is highly material to investors. There are a, 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 a groups of, of investors simply focused on making sure uh, that uh, uh, climate change uh, is addressed by companies with tens of billions of, of investment uh, a, 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 a between them. And that's why we work through the investor groups. So we've got the ISB, the IAASB, a, a, the standards, the audit, but we've also got something else the investors are asking for. And this was a group, just, just to be clear, uh, we got lots of signatures at the end, but uh, a group of over $100 trillion worth of members. So that's the IIGCC, a, that's the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change. It's the Principles for Responsible Investment. It's the UN Environment Program. It's the Pension and Lifetime Savings uh, Institution in the UK. It's the Investor Group on Climate Change in Australia. It's the Asia Investor Group on a, a, a climate change. It's the uh, the UN Asset Owners Alliance. It it it, it, it look. It's a huge uh, a group, and and they have said, look for the avoidance of all doubt. Be clear. 
that climate related risks are material factors to us that should be reflected appropriately in financial statements. So the assumption that Nick is making about materiality and that you were asking about Sunday, that is uh, absolutely uh, uh, clear uh, where that stands. So it's material. Secondly, that they want to see both the issuer and the auditor follow, and they put it this way, in the letter and the spirit, the opinions of ISB and IAASB. And then they've said a third thing. They've said, look, those standards mean that you need to show assumptions and you need to make assumptions. And those assumptions should be assumptions that are compatible with a, the Paris a, Agreement, which is that we're going to keep climate change to well below two degrees. Now, of course, if we do do accounting that way, then we will not be investing in the future in stranded assets. In the short term, yes, look, there's, there's, there's going to have to be some write-offs if we've been valuing a, a climate exposed assets as though there is no uh, a climate uh, uh, issue. Uh, that's the right thing to do, just as it's the right thing to write off a bad loan uh, uh, rather than pretend that the, the organization uh, is solvent. But the most important thing about this is it should not be possible for anyone who is both following the standard setters guidance and the recommendation of investors of well below two degrees to I think that it is sensible uh, financially um, as well as environmentally to, to uh, 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 invest in stranded assets. And look, I think this is going to be followed up with individual investors. Uh, some of you may have seen the uh, a declaration recently from, uh, from BlackRock, which again, BlackRock saying exactly what it is that is said in the investor's letter, that they expect to see this uh, done, that they expect the assumptions to be well below two degrees, and that they will consider this when they think about their voting, on the annual report, on the auditor appointment, and on directors. And I think we will see other people follow up on that. I hope, by the way, there is no way that there will be a vote against anyone because the standards changed. And we should all, from now on, be applying the opinion of IFRS and IAASB. So we've crossed the Rubicon. Look, it's not surprising, I think, that we've been doing that. Groups, as you say, like uh, CDSB, Sandeep, I mean, I've been around for 10, 20 years trying to uh, push uh, this agenda. It's hardly surprising um, a, a now that we've got accounting standards in I hope, the right place. Um, I, so the question of whether we do this is, I hope, resolved. That, though, does open some very interesting uh, questions where CDSB uh, play a hugely important role, which is it's not whether, it's how. And this will raise lots of how questions. So what is the life of a thermal power plant? What is the appropriate value for uh, oil coming out of the ground in 20 or 30 years time? What's the lifetime of an asset? All of those sorts of things uh, 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 need to be thought through. And I very, very much look forward to working with CDSB, uh, continuing to work with the investors and the investor groups. And indeed, if we can help, with any of the issuers or with the auditors in making sure that this is one, uh, an event that we can look back on and say, look, this is the point at which the accounting profession played its, its uh, role appropriately. You know, one of the central roles of accounting is to make sure that the companies that we're ascribing value to are going concerns. No companies are going concerns if our planet is not a going concern. And it's crazy to be drawing up accounts as if there was no issue about whether our uh, planet is a going concern. And I hope that we can all uh, look back on, on this year as we, or next year as we go to the COP26 and be able to put our hands on our heart and say our profession is doing its job properly. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Um, so in addition to the accounting standard setters, the audit standard setters have clearly set their expectations. 
and and the investors now are clearly kind of have set their expectations. I'm, I'm particularly impressed by by the by the you know the representation of the letter you refer to, and over a hundred trillion under assets and assets under management yeah. uh, represent that letter. A real, I, I, real significant I, I, amount. I think that's right, Sandy. I mean, there is there is no doubt what investors are, are interested in here. I mean, I, I've been involved in this for a while. I, I chaired UNEP during the the Paris uh, conference, and there there was a petition of. 23 24 trillion dollars of investors saying please do a tough deal um a, a, and we thought that was amazing it was the first mega petition that we'd ever put together the climate action 100 plus whose specific job is to make sure that a, a companies operate within the boundaries agreed in paris Cl climate action 100 plus i think now is on its own over 50 trillion dollars worth of investors signed up the PRI is itself nearly a hundred trillion dollars. The IIGCC, I can't remember, Natasha, what is it, 20 trillion? It's very, very clear what investors want. Very, very clear. And and the opinion from ISB and from the IAASB says, yep, the, our principles mean climate must be included. And then if you want to follow the investor guidance, and it should be within the limits of Paris. Thank you. Brilliant. So if we now move on to Natasha, um, Natasha, you, you and Saracen have really been leading the way, as David's already mentioned, when it comes to engaging with your investor companies in relation to reflecting material climate related matters, climate related risks um, in, in financial statements and actually not just engaging with companies. And, and you've already had some wins. Um, so it'd be really great to learn what you expect when it comes to financial reporting and climate, why this information is needed. Um, and a question often asked is actually, how is this information used by investors? Yeah, sure. And, and thank you. And thank you to the two previous speakers who have provided an excellent backdrop for, for the work that we've been, been doing. Um, I, I guess I would just start, if I may, and, and I'm going to go on to the specifics of some engagements and the successes we've had, and therefore I think the, the way forward on that. But, but just to reiterate, I mean, I, I think uh, the really critical question to just start with is, is, you know, what is the purpose of finance, right? And as an active manager, and I think any investment manager, passive or active, ultimately, this is about allocating capital, deploying capital in a way that is aligned with society. And the role that accounts plays in that uh, is, is absolutely vital. I mean, it's one of the kind of really key levers within the financial infrastructure, which determines which way capital is deployed. And this is something that certainly I uh, uh, really um, sort of internalized, if you like, following the financial crisis and, and something that allowed um, us at Saracen to, to really focus our gaze on the accounts and that the role that they were playing in in driving that market-wide capital deployment. Um, so with, against that backdrop, yeah, we started looking at uh, accounting and particularly its role in helping to combat the climate crisis back in 2016. And at that time, Bloomberg was consulting on the TCFD and we wrote into the TCFD to say, this is an absolutely excellent initiative, but one thing is missing here, which is the financial statements. And we continue to kind of look into this over the years. And then in 2018, what we decided to do um, was to actually delve into the details of the financial statements of eight European oil and gas companies. Uh, and the idea there was to just demonstrate both to ourselves, but also externally, why it was we needed to, 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 to kind of um, unpack this and look at it in a little bit more detail. And what we found uh, which we then published in a report which we titled um, Our Oil and Gas Companies uh, Overstating Their Positions. What we found is uh, two things. Firstly, that the auditors were telling us which were the most critical accounting assumptions, the most material accounting assumptions. And secondly, that uh, several of those assumptions would absolutely be impacted by climate related risks. So both the physical impacts, but also the decarbonization. And with oil and gas companies, it's really the decarbonization, the energy transition, that absolutely was a key factor that needed to be taken into account when you were drawing up those accounts. And in this case, we really focused in on that long-term quantity price assumption. So the oil and gas price assumptions that were underpinning, for, for example, impairment testing. 
Now, it was very clear to us by delving into the notes of the accounts that these assumptions were being drawn up in a way that assumed business as usual. There was no sense in which when you were looking at that long term oil price at the, uh, you know, the, the decrease in demand that you were going to have to see if Paris was going to be implemented and we were going to get to net zero by 2050, none of that was being looked at. Indeed, the assumption was that those oil prices were between roughly 70 or 80 dollars a barrel uh, and would increase with inflation into the future. And that clearly didn't sit well with the world of decarbonization. So we started asking questions about that and we published the report and, and, and asked how material really is this? And of course, we got quite a lot of pushback, but, but we also got quite a lot of interest. And on the back of that, we built a, uh, a coalition of, of other concerned investors at that time, about one trillion. So we're now we're up to the hundred trillion or so that David is talking about. But we, we wrote to the uh, largest uh, audit firms, the big four in the UK, to the managing partners, and we set out as investors our view that climate risks were material. So again, to Nick's point, it's really important in your assessment of materiality what investors think. So we set it out very plainly. This is material, and we therefore expect our auditors remembering that the auditor ultimately works for the shareholder, our auditors ensure that they were looking at climate risks when they were conducting that audit. And we had some really, really fruitful and constructive engagements with the big four over 2019. We then in parallel or a little bit later, uh, in November 2019, we wrote to the audit committee chairs at Shell, BP and Total. And we just started there because, again, we had done a deep dive into the financial statements. We had seen one assumption we felt was probably not aligned with Paris. And we wanted to let them know that we, uh, we were worried about that. And we wanted to get comfort that they were starting to look at decarbonization in a very real sense in those financial statements. At the same time, we pointed out in these letters that in the front half, in the narrative report, uh, there was a lot of detail about the energy transition, huge amounts of detail, and yet there was radio silence in the back half in those financial statements. So there was a question of consistency there. Um, and on, on the back of that, we had some good, good discussions, but I think really the impact of those engagements came through, uh, and many of you will have seen in the latest annual report and accounts and actually thereafter. So all three of them, now, in the 2019 Air Reports accounts published this spring, all three of them uh, included climate risks in the financial statement disclosures. All three of them lowered the long-term commodity price assumptions and recognized material impairments associated with that. And indeed, what was quite interesting for BP and, and, and Shell, where we had, uh, by the way, copied this letter to the lead audit partner in all three cases, EY and Deloitte, uh, so EY for Shell, Deloitte for, for, for BP, included in their critical accounting, um, critical audit matters, that climate risks was a really key concern. And moreover, in the case of BP, Deloitte called out the fact that BP's long-term commodity price assumptions, whilst they had been lowered, remained above a level that would be consistent with Paris. Now that was uh, very gratifying to see, very welcome from the investment community. It was exactly what we asked the auditors to do and highly unusual, I would say. Uh, in most uh, auditor reports, the shareholders are quite bland, quite boilerplate. This was actually doing us a great service. Um, what we then saw, which I think is equally interesting, is just a little, you know, literally weeks later, BP came out with a statement to say that they were now lowering long-term commodity price assumptions to levels consistent in their view with Paris and that they would be recognizing an impairment between 13 and 17 and a half billion dollars. Now that was quite a big step but from my perspective and given the engagement that we had undertaken not surprising very very difficult I think for um, for an audit committee where the auditor themselves have pointed out an inconsistency in the critical accounting assumptions, not to then have a very uh, 
uh, you know, sort of deep think about whether that was right and whether that needed to be changed. And we were very pleased to see the board decide to make that change. And we'll obviously see in, in, in coming months what, what will uh, ultimately be um, written down at BP. But I, I think, even if anything, what these three um, engagements have shown us is, is firstly that climate risks are absolutely material. There can be no doubt about that. So again, to, to, to Nick and David's points, you know, the, this, this is really indisputable now. Secondly, that companies can act quickly. You know, we wrote to BP, Tota and Shell in November. So about this time of year, you know, they could act quickly and there was no need for any new requirements or regulations. And finally, I think the third point that we take away from this is the auditor plays a really critical role. And it's a role that we hope that they will continue to play in the future at a much wider number of companies. So what are we doing about this? David has mentioned that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge uh, number of investor associations that are now calling for this. We've had BlackRock come out recently We've been working very, very closely with IDCC and we will be coming out with a more detailed publication setting out, we hope usefully, exactly the expectations that uh, investors have of directors and also the exact expectations that, direct, um, that investors have of auditors. So I would say essentially there are five things really that we would expect of companies now with with regards to climate risk and with regard to, to Paris alignment of those accounting assumptions. Firstly, that there's an affirmation, just a statement to say, we have considered the Paris Climate Agreement in drawing up our accounts. Secondly, that adjustments are made to assumptions were relevant. Thirdly, that in the notes to the accounts, that you get some sensitivity analysis. So particularly where companies are choosing not to use Paris aligned assumptions. So assumptions that will be consistent with getting to net zero by 2050, where they say, well, we're not gonna use that because we don't think it's gonna happen. Well, fine, but then in the notes of the accounts, what we wanna see is to the, the extent to which those financial statements would have been impacted if Paris aligned assumptions have been used. So in the end, investors get the disclosures that they're seeking. Fourthly, what we're really interested in is how resilient dividends will be to Paris alignment. Now, many of you will know that dividend rules are, are different from accounting rules. In many jurisdictions, you've got a kind of solvency regime or in the UK, a capital maintenance regime. And so the test for dividends is slightly different. And we just want assurance that dividend sustainability will be there. And finally, something frankly that's already required is uh, a confirmation that the accounts are consistent with the narrative reporting. So there's consistency there, which is generally already required in, in most markets. Likewise, expectations for the auditors to be kicking the tires, to give us as their ultimate clients assurance that they have considered climate risk, but moreover, they've considered Paris alignment and that where there is a, a disconnect with Paris alignment, that that's called out. The auditor can call that out in the report to shareholders. So we have that information. And likewise, if there are risks to dividends, et cetera, that, that, that they would point that out to us. So those are the, so I mean, I, I guess, you know, there, there could be variations of these different things, but you know, what we're trying to do is send a very clear message as to what it is the investment community would like to see. As I say, you know, Saracen have been very involved. We've, we've uh, you know, led on a number of these engagements and, and on this forthcoming publication, but it is supported by a very, very large and growing group of, of uh, managers around the world. Um, and indeed, one of the other questions in our mind and, and part of the kind of policy outreach is to ask whether actually governments should be standing up and saying, you know what, Paris aligned accounting and audit should be mandatory. The threat we face in terms of you know, the, the, the climate crisis is a public interest threat. And whilst we as investors can press and push and, and directors can stand up and say, yes, this is the right thing to do, maybe it's time that governments just said, you know, th this is just the minimum legal standard.
So I'll, I'll leave you with, with that thought and obviously happy to take any, any Q and A, but, um, but uh, yeah, ho hopefully the message is clear that we really need to see the Paris Agreement integrated in those financial statements. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Um, so to summarize, you know, the accounting standards allow and expect climate risk to be reflected in the financial statements where considered material both from a size and nature perspective. Um, and as has been made clear by both David and Natasha, the investment expectations for the consideration and reflection of climate related matters are very clear. They do consider this to be material. Um, as we've learned from Natasha, companies though can act quickly and, 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 and as has been explained, kind of there are a few examples already out there. Um, but also to note that auditors also have an important role to play um, and going beyond beyond the IFRS paper, beyond next paper, um, there's expectation that companies should be reporting or trying to report aligned with Paris and, and, and the, the goals set there. So before we move on to questions and, and a reminder now for our audience to continue to submit questions, um, I just wanted to flag that the CDSB are developing some practice guidance at the moment, which is to be released in December um, to support preparers in how to begin considering and integrating climate related matters into financial reporting. Um, this guidance will build on Nick's November 2019 paper and focuses on some of the standards that are highlighted in that paper, really delving into um, some of the accounting aspects where climate related matters may need to be considered and the disclosure implications um, supported alongside with mock examples to help companies and preparers who are starting off on this kind of journey. So if we move on to uh, the Q&A. The first question I'd like to ask, as, as I started off, kind of TCF, the NAV reporting is progressing. There's already a lot of momentum there, um, but there's clear kind of work to be done. So how does this fit in in relation to TCFD and kind of scenario analysis that companies may be developing at the moment? And could TCFD be seen as an input into the climate reporting in relation to um, kind of the accounting side and financial reporting aspects? I'm happy to kick off with that, Cindy. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I think absolutely these are really complementary, and and I think that um, you know, frankly, if you're if you're developing these detailed scenarios for TCFD and and not uh, thinking about how that should be reflected in the accounts, there there is the inconsistency that that I was mentioning earlier. Um, I would also make a point, which is that, um, you know, it's actually often the other way around. You know, what, one of the things that has perplexed me is that there's a real focus on the narrative and the need to change strategies. And yet strategies aren't going to change until the numbers change. You know, maybe I'm a cynical economist, but, you know, if we change the numbers, then the strategies will just naturally follow. If we get Paris aligned numbers, we will get Paris aligned strategies. It's absolutely clear. And again, using BP as an example, it wasn't a surprise, I don't think, that once they said they were going to align their accounts with Paris, that then they took a big step up in terms of their commitment for, uh, for, for winding down ultimately their fossil fuel business because it makes sense, because that's where the incentives are driving you. It's kind of Adam Smith's invisible hand working through the account. So uh, I would say they're absolutely consistent. They need to be consistent. But if you're going to focus on one thing first, it should be the numbers. And I'd say as well, I agree with everything Natasha said, that actually some of the thinking that you need to do for TCFD is exactly the same thinking that you need to do in drawing up the numbers. So now that we've got the numbers mandated, if you're thinking about TCFD, you can borrow from that and then do TCFD. If you've been doing TCFD, you can think about that and that will help you with the numbers. These are absolutely complementary, just as the front end and the back end of the annual report are not designed as two completely separate documents. They're, they're designed to give you a, a complete picture of what it is that the firm is up to. And, and so, so but these are completely complementary. Thank you, Natasha, David. Um, Next question. So the focus and just kind of the focus of the discussion today has been on climate. Um, the question received is: What about other pressing environmental and social matters? Should these risks and matters also be considered, or can these risks be considered under the accounting standards? Um, and from an investor perspective, how important is this? Um, and and I'm gonna, to add on to that, um, 
is there any need of requirement for for the IFRS standards to be developed or or you know are they are they suitable um as they are to tackle both climate and kind of other environmental social risks as well so should i should i kick off on this um but clearly environmental social governance is, is a very broad remit it's the first thing it covers many factors and, and considerations um I would say we have three initiatives underway at the IFRS Foundation, which uh, the board is, is part of, that considers this broader landscape. Um, the first is the board itself is developing an update to its management commentary practice statement. So guidance on how to write a good management commentary. You would see, I think, uh, many of the features that already appear in the work from the Integrated Reporting Council on narrative reporting in terms of the principles in what we're developing already. So very much about coherence through management commentary statement in terms of business models, strategy, risks, performance, but also coherence and consistency with the financial statements that I think we've all talked about this morning as being central to that. And that will be a place for reporting uh, on particularly environmental and social issues. Not all of these are suitable for um, quantifying the financial numbers. Uh, analysts and investors will spend a lot of time today thinking about a company's culture. Could be an asset, could be a liability, but we're not going to put a number on it because I don't think anyone really would regard that as reliable. So that's the first thing. Secondly, um, every five years we ask people, are there any gaps in our existing financial reporting requirements? And we'll be kicking off that process in the first quarter of next year. And so that's an opportunity for all of our stakeholders, whether they be users, preparers, auditors, regulators, to influence our work plan. And again, I'd encourage everyone to do that. And the third aspect, which I mentioned earlier, is the work of our trustees who are looking more broadly, should they be getting involved in the space of sustainability reporting. But again, complementary to uh, IFRS requirements in terms of the numbers, uh, rather than directly influencing. Uh, and. and Nick, can I quickly just probe you then on a, a kind of related question, um, which is, okay, before even looking at all of this, is, is there a need for IFRS to try and sort out the treatment of carbon allowances and kind of work that was historically done in relation to uh, IFRIC 3? Yeah, so so if, if, if my memory serves me right, IFRIC 3 was withdrawn many years ago, uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago. So we do have a project in our pipeline on pollutant pricing mechanisms uh, and to address whether there's diversity of accounting for those mechanisms. Um, we, again, I think as part of our, what we call our agenda consultation, our future work plan, we'll be asking for our stakeholders to prioritize that project, you know, compared to other requirements on our time. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're in listening mode in terms of what we should be doing next in that space. Thank you. And, and, and Natasha David. May um, I just add, add a, a point? Um, but... Sorry. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of um, uh, sort of freezing of screen, so I hope you can hear me. But, but I, um, you know, I don't see why any ESG factor um, which is material and therefore would have an economic impact and feed through to cash flows would not need to be reflected in the accounts in some way. So, you know, I, I think that that for, for me would be the same. And it goes back to Nick's earlier point about principles based, you know, they don't have to talk about climate change in IFRS for it to naturally be needed to be included if it's got a material impact. Likewise, you know, if you've got a new environmental regulation coming in so to do with plastics or whatever it happens to be um to the extent that that's re foreseeable and reasonably certain then that and would have an impact on a business's cash flows going forward then i would think it would be absolutely right and proper for it to be reflected in in the accounting um so i think this whole area of where you know, you've got sustainability reporting on one side and financial reporting on another it creates almost sometimes um, a false dichotomy where, you know, there's quite a lot of, of uh, grayness in that, where, you know, things that are in sort of sustainability reports would need to naturally ultimately be reflected in financial reports. Um, maybe that's just my, my uh, biased view, but I, I think we need to be a little bit more open 
um, and holistic in the way that we're thinking about this, ultimately to ensure that we understand the true economic health of that business. Um, you know, asset retirement obligations are a key area where there's quite a lot of controversy around how the ultimate environmental liabilities are being understated um, uh, systematically. And there's been quite a lot of work done there. And that's definitely a financial statement issue and it's an environmental issue. So that, that's one, one example. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Um, a question that we received from uh, LinkedIn, how difficult is it to assess alignment with Paris Agreement and are there any guidelines you know, for, to help with this sort of assessment? Um, and then to tie onto that as well, um, many assets are vulnerable to physical changes associated with climate change. And if organizations are only reporting risks to these assets under a sub two degree scenario, will this underestimate the risk? Shall, shall, shall I kick off on this one, Sunday? Um, first of all, I, 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 I don't think. I mean, there are a, a experts that are already used in trying to decide what is going to be the lifetime of a plant, um, when it is you need to write it off, what the oil price is going to be into the future. A, th there isn't any very clear guidance about how it is that you should think about this. Uh, there are also some sources, but not nearly enough and not nearly definitive enough about how it is that um, your numbers are consistent with Paris. So, look, next year, we're going to have to be doing this with a great de degree of management judgment. I hope that managements are coming back to groups like CDSB and to the, uh, the International Energy Agency and all of these sorts of people and saying, please, can you give us uh, some guidance so that we are more consistent? So there, there isn't any change from where we are right now. We're just saying Paris is one of the things that you need to take into account and uh, hopefully we can move forward from there and do that better. The, the second question then about ooh, what what is it that I should do in the event that I think that climate change may go above 2% and I've got a, 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 an asset um, that a, a, a is, it might be overvalued a, a on that basis. Well, I think if it's overvalued, you should a, a use your proper judgment about whether you want to use the higher or the lower of the values. Under all circumstances, I would have thought, Nick, the guidance would say you should be declaring in a note to the account exactly what the assumption is that you are making and the degree to which you think that that um, a, a assumption is a credible one. But if you were wanting to say what is the point of this, of the make this consistent with well below two degrees, it the, the key effect is investors do not want their money or rather their client's money applied and spent on assets that are going to become stranded. Because either those assets are indeed stranded when there is the, the, the full response to climate change, which I think is the, an inevitable response to climate change, in which case this was a terrible financial decision, or else we write off the whole world, in which case it was not only a terrible financial decision, it was also a catastrophic environmental decision as well. And that's the motivation that sits a, 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 a behind that. I think some investors would go further and some commentators, Mark Carney, for example, would go further and would say, look, there is a huge risk to our entire economic system. If we have an overvaluation of assets that has not taken climate risk into account and value valued assets as though a, 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 we've got a, a, a climate a, a, a pinch point a, a coming up. And that's right. And the way we take risk out of the system a, is that we use accounting. That was why it was, you know, statutory accounting was put there after the collapse of the City Bank of Glasgow, was to make sure that assets were not overvalued a, and that there was a report and it was audited and so on and so forth. And so it's just applying those basic those basic principles to make sure that a, if a company director says that they're promoting the success of the company uh, for the interests of the members of the shareholders after having taken account of all the stakeholders, that that is indeed what they're doing. And if they are doing that, they should not be overvaluing stranded assets. Thank 
Thank you, David. And just, I mean, I, I might just add. Uh, I mean, I think it's absolutely cr- the disclosure of judgments and assumptions is absolutely critical because without those, it's actually very difficult. I think to have a dialogue with with management uh, around the numbers and the impact. Uh, so, um, yeah, if these are material, those assumptions do need to be disclosed. Brilliant. And, and just for the benefit of our audience, I've just picked up a comment um, in, in the LinkedIn uh, chat, noting that there are various alignment methodologies available in relation to the first part of my question, um, specifically PACTA, P-A-C-T-A, uh, PCAF, P-C-A-F, uh, and target setting through the science-based target initiatives may also help the process when it comes to reporting. Um, as we're approaching kind of the, the, the end of our discussion, I think we'll close questions. And I know, Natasha, you, you have to kind of drop off um, a, a bit early. So I, I, in, in, in advance, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and, and your insight and, and um, kind of, you know, the story that Saracen have been through and progress you've made and, and driving this change is, is, is kind of, is, you know, is really interesting and, and wonderful to hear from. Um, if, if I could just, you know, ask um you know participants who join us today kind of key a key takeaway um for the audience um you know if there's one thing that they can take away from from this kind of one hour discussion we've had what, what would that be in, in 30 seconds or less uh, if you start with natasha perhaps first just because i know you're heading off oh sorry natasha are you still there Sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble with my connectivity. Do, could you repeat the question? If, very, if you have kind of a, a, you know, a, a one one line takeaway for our audience who have, who have joined us today, um, from your perspective, what, what would that be? I what would that be? Uh, it would be to uh, to have a ha, have a think about whether your accounts are taking the Paris Agreement into account and therefore consistent with getting onto a net net zero pathway and instruct your auditors to to, to do the same. Nick, over to you. Yeah, it's, it's very simple. So just to reiterate that existing IFRS requirements do address climate related risks, uh, that these are material. It's important that we see disclosure around assumptions and judgments. And indeed, I believe investors are looking for a coherent story to be portrayed both in narrative reporting uh, one that is consistent with the financial statements that helps build confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And David? Yeah, I think if it was me, I'd say, look, the, the world has changed. The auditing standards and the accounting standards have changed and the investors have been absolutely clear. But um, I think that's a very big deal. Um, but it's very, very difficult to put that uh, as number one item on the news so that everybody knows about it. So please, for those people that are in the audience, you know, come back to us, go to the PRI website, which has got a page about all the things that's happened. Nick, I'm sure you've got stuff on ISB and please tell everyone that this has happened because we have crossed the Rubicon here. It is clear if you want to apply these standards, what it is that you have to do. It's clear what it is that investors want from you, but it has been very difficult. We've given it a bit of a shot, not terribly successful, to try and be on the front page of the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. That has proved very difficult. So it's so important that the people are on this call, that they know that this has happened. They talk to their colleagues. They talk to every group that they possibly can. The application of accounting standards is now very clear, and it's actually different from the way that it was in the past. Uh, Let's get on with this, because that's the way that we can support our, our, our sustainable planet. Brilliant. Thank you. And I don't really think I can add much more to that. So all I've got to say is thank you for your time, Nick, David and Natasha, who's just dropped off. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. And I hope you keep safe and well. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Sunday.